All right, now in Acts chapter 25, of course, at the very, very end of Acts chapter 24, we see, you know, that's, Paul's kind of just getting, you know, he has to plead his case before all these different people. So basically, we see at the very last verse of chapter 24, I covered this last week, but it says, but after two years, Portius Festus came in into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Paul was bound up and just and just just sitting there. He's at Caesarea, and Felix just um, he's not releasing him. And it says earlier in that chapter that yeah, he was just basically hoping that someone would come or that that Paul would pay him money and basically bribe him so that he could be sent free. And that's why he just kept on just just holding him there, and also that he wanted to show the Jews a pleasure. So he just left them bound, left them in prison, like whatever. No big deal. He's just messing with a man's life here. I mean, imagine losing two years of your life just being in prison for no reason whatsoever. You did nothing wrong. They're accusing you of a capital crime. They want him to die. They want him to lose his life. All of these people know full well he did nothing wrong. They even say that. They say, like, this guy hasn't done anything wrong. Yet they still just keep him bound. Why? Because it makes the people happy. And that's how crooked it is. But we see this anyway. So we're jumping into to chapter 25. The end of chapter 24 explains that Paul's been already locked up for two years. Now we, now we introduce Festus, right? Felix is, is who he's been dealing with up to this point, or in the previous chapter. Now Festus comes in, and it says in verse 1, Now when Festus was come into the province after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So he comes in the province, he goes, and he goes up to Jerusalem. It says, then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him and desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. So what's happening here is Portius Festus, he comes into the land, he comes in, he goes up to Jerusalem, and the chief priests go up to him and say, hey, you know, they inform him against Paul. They're saying there's this prisoner, Paul, over at Caesarea, you know, we want this guy to die. I mean... After two years, the Jews are still saying, they're still going after him. They see Festus come into the town, and they're, and they're saying, hey, we're going to go We're gonna go get this guy, see if he'll help us to get Paul killed. So they inform him against Paul. They, they lay their grievance to him. And um, this is, they desired favor against him, that he would send for him to Jerusalem. So he's saying, they're, they're trying to get Festus to say, hey, Call Paul over here to Jerusalem. Bring him into this city so that we can try him, you know. And, of course, their plan is so that they could just lay wait and kill him. They didn't want him to have another opportunity to have a trial or anything like that. They're not trying to do this the lawful way. They just want to go and kill him. And, um, but Festus does not concede to that. He, he says, no, wait, we see in verse 4, it says, But Festus answered, that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself would depart shortly. Through. He's like, no, no, we're not going to call him here. He's like, I'm just going to go there. He's like, I'm already planning on going there, so I'll go there and I'll hear him. It says in verse 5, let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. So he's saying, no, instead of him you know, bringing him here, because he knew they, were, they wanted to kill him, uh, I'm sure he wasn't just, just a total moron. He understood, and he knew probably the events that had already happened with, with Paul even being sent to Caesarea in the first place because they had conspired to kill Paul. And um, so he said, no, no. He's like, we're going to try him. And you guys can come with me. You can go over there and, and you can accuse him if there's anything wrong. And we'll, we'll judge him there. We'll judge him in Caesarea. So verse 6 says, uh, and when he had tarried among them more than 10 days, he went down unto Caesarea. And the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. So he gets into Caesarea, and he says, okay, let's bring Paul forth. Verse 7. It says, and when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. Now, we saw this in chapter 24. We see it again in chapter 25. And this is a common theme with the Jews, with the chief priests, with these people in authority. They're just laying all kinds of charges against him. They're just bringing whatever they can against Paul, whatever they can conjure up, whatever they can make up. It says they can't even prove it. So they're just bringing these accusations against Paul. And this is, I want to I stop on this point real quick or for a little while because this is a serious sin. 
And it's something that's, that's real common these days. It's real easy to do. And I think some people might not even realize how bad of a sin it is. These people are bringing false accusations against the Apostle Paul, and they're railing against them. They're railing on them. And um, especially in the day that we live in today with the social media, it's easy for people to kind of spout off their mouth, right? Um, you see it all the time on, like, on things like Facebook. That's one of the reasons why I don't really like Facebook that much. It's a, it's, it's a kind of, we were talking about this before service. There's a useful tool, you know, if you want to keep in touch with some family or friends or something, you can see how your family's doing, how other people are doing. It's kind of nice. But there's so many other things, so much drama, and, and people get involved in, in strife and fighting and airing dirty laundry and all kinds of just garbage happens on Facebook that ought not to happen. And one of the things I've noticed, at least in regard, because I guess probably I'm more interested in this stuff, you know, people post sermons and, and, and this and that, and you always got people, you know, this guy's a heretic, this guy's a heretic, and, and everything else going on. And what's interesting is, is there's people that I know and I know very well that end up getting slandered. And, and people just, they might hear one little clip of some video or something, and they're real quick just to judge and to throw something out there and just say, and just make up stuff and basically be a railer and a false accuser. Now, it's an important thing we're going to get into that, but first of all, when you see something on the internet, don't ever just automatically assume that it's true. They have these stupid, I think they're called memes, right? They have these pictures and people write words on them and stuff. Or there's articles, all this other stuff. People, especially today, I mean, this is like, the amount of disinformation that's out on the internet now is crazy. People do it now just on purpose to see if they can get, to get like news stories or whatever to go viral and see how many people they can trick into thinking that this is actually real. They'll Photoshop pictures, and then they'll put this thing and like, see, and they'll kind of run along with a, with a train of thought that people have. So if they're trying to target like a, a, a conspiracy theory or whatever, or, um, or, or they'll, they'll, even with things like, you know, you see a lot of police brutality stuff, and, and there's all these pictures and videos, and, and, and there's a lot of horrible police brutality going on, but then someone else will come along, and they'll just, just kind of make something up and throw that in there. And if you're already kind of caught up in this thing, like, oh, you believe that all this stuff happens, and it's like, sure, you understand it happens, but like, don't just be real quick to just accept these things as fact or as truth if you don't look them up for yourself. And unfortunately, a lot of people do that. And for some things, it might not be as big of a deal, but when it comes to a person's character, when it comes to, to you know, a preacher or things that they say, don't just take something that someone else says secondhand and just receive that as the truth. Now, I'm not saying it's a lie, but you don't know. But the fact is, if you don't know, don't go and then you start sharing stuff and spreading the lie and just, just keep rumors propagating throughout the internet because you don't know and you didn't look it up for yourself. If, you, if you're going to post something, if you're going to say something about someone, you better know for sure that what you're saying is right and what you're saying is true. Before you go and make an accusation against somebody, before you go and make a slander about somebody. Here's a perfect example, right? We have these, we have these videos that were put out by, by Pastor Anderson and, and Paul Whitmer, right? So you get people that will say, oh yeah, he's just in it for the money because, because the DVDs are available online for, for sale, right? And they'll say, oh yeah, see, look, this pastor, he's just in it for the money, he shouldn't be doing that stuff, and, and they'll throw out all these accusations just because they don't, may not like the person. Without, with zero evidence and no factual basis behind what they're saying, they just don't like something, so they're just going to mouth off and just, and just run their mouth over something that they know nothing about. I mean, and this is, like, to me it's not that big of a deal, but he doesn't collect any money from these videos. I know that for a fact. He gets zero money for the videos. That's just one example, but, but that's the type of thing, just to give you an example of what people will just throw out there, and then someone else shares it and is oh yeah see this and then and then these things just get just snowball effect and people start thinking well all of these people are saying it it must be true and that's part of human nature you got to watch out for that just because you see a lot of people saying a bunch of stupid things doesn't make it true um and these are there's a the the, the internet facebook especially is full of false accusations it's full of people who like to rail on other people because they don't like them they don't agree with something that they say 
And now all of a sudden they come out and they just start railing on people. And we're going to see a little bit about what the Bible says about, about railing and making false accusations. You ought not to be so quick to judge and just assume things about people, especially if you don't really know them. You don't know anything about that person. Don't be so quick and hasty to think that just because you see something else written about them that it's automatically true. We see in 2 Chronicles 32, I'll, I'll read this for you. You don't have to turn there. Um, I will have you turn to, let's check my notes here. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll read for 2 Chronicles 32. This was the king of Assyria, Sennacherib. It says in verse 16 of 2, or 2 Chronicles 32, And his servant spake yet more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of mine hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of mine hand. So here you see King Sennacherib is just mouthing off, saying, He's speaking, what he's doing, it says he wrote letters to rail on the Lord, and he was speaking against him. So that's kind of giving you a little bit of an understanding of what that railing is. He's railing against God. He's saying, look, just like all of these other so-called gods, they couldn't protect their people. He's saying the Lord's not going to do it either. And he's just kind of blowing off his mouth at God and just, and just having no respect whatsoever. And he's real proud. And we're going to see pride as an attribute of people who just, who just blow off their mouth and say things that they ought not to say and bring false accusations and railing accusations against people. Pride is a big problem in their life. And it says here, because obviously, I mean, if someone has the audacity to say something like that against God, I mean, we know what happens. We know that Hezekiah defeats, or not even Hezekiah, the Lord makes sure that, that Sennacherib is dealt with appropriately. But um, I was just kind of going over this to show you that, you know, it uses railing on the Lord and speaking against them almost synonymously. And then in 1 Corinthians 5.11, the Bible says, But now I have written unto you, not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one no not to eat. So a railer is someone that we need to break fellowship with that person over. If there is a brother, if there's if there's a brother in Christ that's a railer, that's a false accuser that brings railing accusations against people. The Bible says, hey, that's enough for you to say, you know what? We're not, gonna, we're not friends. We're not going to hang out. I'm not going to even sit down and eat with you. We're not going to go out to lunch when you're someone who just goes out and brings railing accusations against people. We're not going to fellowship. We're not going to have that. I mean, he lists that here with fornicators and idolaters and drunkards. That's how bad it is to be a railer. If you're in 1 Timothy 6, look at verse number 3. It says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. See, there we see pride. Knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Exactly like we saw in 1 Corinthians 5, say withdraw yourself from them. You know, don't even sit down to eat with these people. 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is talking more about false prophets, but he's saying, look, they're proud, they don't know anything, and they're, they're, they're doting about questions and strifes of words. They're picking at things and just causing these fights is what they're doing. They're nitpicking at people's words, Right? They have a false doctrine already, and they're bringing up this strife and these words. It says, where have cometh envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings. So because of these, these questions and these strifes of words, these people are nitpicking at this stuff, that's where these railings come from and, and, and these railing accusations against people that ought not to have, you know, that are innocent. Basically, they're getting false witnesses against them. Second Peter chapter 2 um, Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll read for you from 2 Peter chapter 2. It says in verse 10, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, 
speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. So he's again, he's talking about these false prophet reprobates as saying, look, even the angels aren't going to bring a railing accusation against them before the Lord. They're not going to bring these, these railing accusations, the things they can't prove. They're not just going to bring this stuff up and accuse them to the Lord. But it says that these people, as natural brute beasts, they do. They speak evil of the things that they don't even understand. They just go and mouth off, like Sennacherib just mouthed off against God. He doesn't understand the Lord. He didn't understand God. Yet he just goes and he mouths off against Him. Exactly what they're doing to the Apostle Paul. They don't understand the Lord. They don't understand God. Obviously, they're caught up in their false religion, their false prophets. Yet they're bringing up these railing accusations speaking evil against Paul for something that he didn't even do. Things they can't even prove, they're just mouthing off about it. If you're in 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 15. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So here's the answer for that, for, for us, for, for Christians to, to, um, to avoid this and uh, to kind of, basically he's just saying to make yourself above reproach. Let's look at that again. Look at verse 15. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, Christian, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, Having a good conscience. Now, in order for you to have a good conscience, that means you're not going out and sinning. You're not breaking God's word. You're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, right? When you go to bed at night, you can think back on everything you did throughout the day. If you have a good, clear conscience, then you can say, you know what? I know that I'm right with God. I didn't go out. I didn't go down to the bar. I didn't, you know, turn on the hell vision and, and start filling my mind with garbage. I know that what I did was right. So he's saying, look, have a good conscience. It says that whereas um, they speak evil of you, so when that they speak evil of you, if you have a good conscience when they're speaking evil of you as evildoers, it says they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. If you're doing that which is right, if you can make yourself be above reproach, if you can have a clear conscience and you can go to bed at night and, and, and say, you know what, I didn't do anything wrong. Now, the false accusations may come, but they're the ones that are going to be ashamed if there's no truth to what they're saying, right? They're going to be the ones that are going to be found out to be liars. They're the ones that's going to come up and it's just going to look even worse on them because ultimately in the end, you know, things, the truth will come to light. It will. And in the end, now in the middle of it, it may be looking really bad. People might, might, you know, everyone might turn their back on you if people are falsely accusing you of something really bad, you know, but, but in the end, I think if you're doing that which is right, people who are falsely accusing you, they're going to be the ones that are ashamed. And um, now, as with so many other of God's laws, the law regarding false witnesses and people who bring up these railing accusations against people um, was not enforced back then in, in, in Paul's time as well as now. And it's something that ought to be enforced. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 19. I want you to see this in Deuteronomy 19 because this explains what is supposed to happen when people bring up a false witness against somebody because it's a big deal. I mean, think about it. Think about how much your life would be impacted if someone just made up some lies about you, especially like, I mean, Paul, they made up accusations against him that, sh that in their law should have been worthy of death. I mean, think about if someone were to accuse you of a crime that is worthy of death in today's society. I mean, that's a big deal. That's going to have a big impact on you. And they, get, they, they accuse you to the point where you're arrested and you're sitting in jail. I mean, you're sitting in jail for a couple of years because maybe someone accused you of murdering somebody or do, you know, whatever, where, where it's like now you could be facing death. That is a serious crime to commit against somebody if you're just making up lies about it. But, see, nothing's going to happen to these people this time because 
They all knew. All the politicians, everyone in charge, all the judges, they knew Paul didn't do anything wrong. They knew that they delivered him for envy. They knew that it was just questions about their law just because Paul claimed that Jesus Christ was alive, which he was. But, but nothing worthy of death or of bonds, they said. He's not even supposed to be in jail. And they knew it, yet they still held on to him because they're corrupt. But um, let's see here in Deuteronomy 19, what is supposed to happen when somebody... When somebody brings forth a railing accusation or has a false witness, look at verse number 15 of Deuteronomy 19. 19.15. It says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin and any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Basically, and it says it elsewhere, if you're going to bring a crime against someone, especially like a capital crime, they're saying it's, it's not going to fly just on one witness. You can't just have one person saying, oh yeah, I saw so-and-so kill somebody, and then that's enough for that person to be put to death. The Bible says, no, you need at least two witnesses, two independent witnesses saying they both saw it, and they can both testify to that, two or three people saying that that is how the matter is going to be established. It's never going to be just, you know, he said, she said, one person says this and the other person says that. You can't go off of that to, to condemn somebody. Look at verse 16, it says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, meaning that which didn't happen, you know. Um, verse 17, Then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. He's saying here, he said, okay, if you have someone, he's bringing an accusation, he's bringing a false witness, you bring both of them before the judges, the judges need to make a diligent inquisition. They need to seek out the matter. They need to go. They need to interview people. They need to talk to both of the people that have, that have a controversy. They need to establish what the facts are and try to find out what is the actual truth of the matter. And it says, if it's found out that the person that brought the accusation against the other person, if it found out that he's lying, then whatever that punishment would have been for that person... The false accuser is going to receive that punishment for bringing up the accusations. In Paul's case, you say they're bringing up accusations against him that should cause him to be put to death. If they find out, hey, Paul's innocent. He didn't do any of those things. You have no proof of that. In fact, there's, con there's all this evidence to the contrary saying that he's innocent. He is not guilty. Then those people who lied about it and said he did something that he didn't do, then they need to be put to death. And the Bible says that that's the way that you deal with false accusers. Now, was that going on in his day? No. Was it the law? I don't know. Maybe it, would, it was back then, but yet all the corrupt politicians anyways, it didn't matter even if it was. They didn't seem to have any fear. You remember when they were accusing Jesus Christ? I mean, they kept bringing witness after witness after witness, but at least the one thing they had is that their witness didn't agree together. So they kept on trying to find two witnesses that could say the same thing so that they could have some kind of legal leg to stand on to put Jesus to death. That's what happened with him. But, I mean, there were people just coming in and just giving these false witnesses, false witnesses. All of those people that, that, that bear false witness against Jesus Christ deserve to be put to death. I mean, if that's the punishment that he was going to be facing for what they were saying, then that's what they deserve. And it's the same thing here with Paul. The chief priests, these people, and a lot of them were the same people anyways, that came up. They were bringing these accusations against Paul because they wanted him put to death. They were lying. He didn't do the things that they, that they were accusing him of doing. Um, they ought to be put to death. That's the way they ought to be judged. That's what the Bible says. And even today in this country, if that were something that we had, you know, there would be a lot less frivolous lawsuits and false accusations against people and a lot less slanders if there was actual real punishments that would occur for being a false witness. I mean, they do have some, you know, perjury in court. But, I mean, how often do you hear about that being enforced? And, um... I mean, even the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, got away with lying and, and, and perjuring under other than just lying under other. So, I mean, when the guy at the top isn't responsible for anything, then why should anyone else be? But, um, 
Let's keep reading here in verse number um, 19. It says, Then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eyes shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. He said, look, when this happens, when a false accuser comes up and you deal with them appropriately, when you deal with them the way that I'm telling you how to do this, and that you give them the same punishment that they're bringing up against this person, people are going to hear that and they're going to fear. And they're going to say, man, I'm going to think twice before I decide to just bring some railing accusation against somebody and decide to lie against somebody and, and say that they did something that they didn't do if I might be the one punished for it. If it's going to come back and turn around on me, the Bible says they're going to hear and they're going to fear. And that's going to help you to commit no more of those evil things amongst you. And it says, and he says also, look, thine eye shall not pity. He said, don't pity the person. You might say, oh, well, he didn't really do anything. He just told a lie. He says, life shall go for life. Don't get soft. Don't, don't pity that person and say, oh, well, yeah, but... You know, I know he, he falsely accused them of murdering somebody or whatever, but, but you know, he's in a bad spot and he didn't really have anything else to do. And, um, and, and really, I mean, he didn't hurt anybody. He just, he just lied. He says, no, don't pity that person. They don't need pity. They need to receive the same exact punishment that the person that they're accused is a serious man. And that's going to stop. He said, that's going to put away the evil from among you. Now, and again, there's, there's really two purposes for rendering appropriate punishments to criminals, right? Here's what we see. This is an appropriate punishment for somebody who brings up a false accusation against someone. And it's twofold. One reason is obviously to, to help to make reparations for the person that was violated. So in many instances, you know, when somebody is, is violated, they get, um, and I'm just talking about punishments in general, right? Not just the false accusing, but just punishments in general for crime. When a crime is committed, someone's violated. Whether their life was taken from them, their property, you know, something was taken from that person. One of the purposes of a punishment is to, is to help restore what was lost to that person. Now, you can't always do that. I mean, if someone is murdered, you can't bring their life back. So the only thing you can do is say, well, that person then is going to die to, to cover the blood that was shed for the person that he murdered. But the other thing... The other purpose of these punishments is not just reparations, but it's then still a proper fear of the crimes that are being committed so that they understand that, hey, if I do this, there is going to be a just recompense, a punishment coming my way. And if I know that that punishment is going to be meted out, if I know that that punishment is going to be given and handed down to me for doing these things, I might think twice about committing those crimes. If they're the punishments especially that God has ordained that ought to be given out for these various crimes. Now, this is a huge problem in our legal system today. And it wasn't always this way. We used to have much more just punishment for crimes than we do today. But we today have some of the worst criminals today that are going out. They get a slap on the wrist and then they go back out and continue to do the wicked things that they had done before because they're never really getting punishment. And what I'm referring to mostly here is the perverted, child-molesting predators out there that are out stalking kids and defiling them and doing things that are horrible that no normal person would ever dream of, ruining their lives. And you see these people, they get like either, either a few years in prison, they get locked up in a cage for a few years, or even a few months, or whatever it is, Basically, they get nothing. They go to a place, they get fed, they can watch TV, they can do, you know, lift weights, they go to this place. I mean, a lot of prisons these days, I mean, not that you ever want to be in one, but they're not all that bad as far as, as, far as the, the living conditions. And look, I know there's all different kinds of prisons out there, but, but these people, these sodomites, these wicked, perverted child molesters... Our justice system is a joke 
They think that by, by putting a man in a cage for a while, all of a sudden they're going to be reformed and they're going to come out and they're not going to be perverted in their head anymore and that everything will be just fine. They say, oh, well, we'll just keep track of them. They have to register and they have to sign in with us every month or whatever. Yeah, right. Like you, you, like you can watch what they're doing every second of the day. These perverts, they go back out. They're repeat offenders. They keep on going out because they're twisted. They're reprobate. Their mind is given over to this uncleanness to do this horrible, wicked sins of defiling children, and they go out and they can't cease from sin. They can't stop themselves. Yet our wicked government does not do anything about it, does not do what they ought to do as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. They ought to just kill them, chop off their heads. That stops the problem dead in its track. That would be a just recompense for the just punishment for their crimes. But what do we do today? No, they just turn them back out on the streets to defile more of our children. It's disgusting. They ought to be put to death. They ought to be stoned to death, the way that the Bible says. People ought to pick up rocks and pelt them in the head until they die. That's what ought to happen to these sickos. And, you know, it's not even just the child. I mean, that is, that is extreme. That is one of the worst cases. And to think that we have a so-called justice system that doesn't put those perverted people to death is just beyond me. It's just, it's, it blows my mind how anyone can say that that's justice, that, that some freak can do those types of things, and that any judge can say, well, I'm just going to send you to prison for two years, and there you go. There's the, the justice scales are balanced now. Shame on you, judges. Shame on America. Shame on this legal system for not dealing with these people appropriately. It's disgusting. But think about the, I mean, this, and this is the way our world is going. This is the way this country is going. The embracing of sin and, and not even calling things sin or crimes anymore. What about the things that deserve the death penalty in the Bible that aren't even crimes anymore today? Anymore. Yes, they used to be. Back, you know, a hundred years ago, most of the things in the Bible, probably, if not all of them, used to be crimes in this country. There used to be a punishment associated with them, and it's a lot more than it is right now. What about sodomy? Sodomy used to be a crime in this country. It used to be against the law to commit sodomy. Hey, it's against God's law. The Bible says if, man, if a man lie with man as he would lie with a woman, they too shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. They need to be killed. That's, that's the punishment for that crime of being a sodomite. What about adultery? Same thing. The Bible says, look, the adulterer or the adulteress needs to be put to death. That is a crime. Not, these days it's accepted. It's just normal for people to commit adultery, get divorces, and then go back out and do whatever. It's not even a crime. This is the society we're living in today, and it's disgusting. People need to get their heads screwed on straight and stop um, pitying the person that needs to be punished. Because when you don't bring the proper punishment, more evil ensues. People say, oh, these, these, these perverts, instead of thinking that their heads are going to get chopped off if they touch a child, well, maybe if I get caught, I'll go to jail for a little bit. I'll be right back out again and do it again. Not a big deal. Not that much of, a, of an incentive to not do something. The adulterer, same thing. You're going to go out and, and cheat on your wife or cheat on your husband? If you're going to be facing a death penalty sentence for that, I think you might think twice about that and say, whoa, hold on a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not get carried away with my lust and just back off for a second and not commit this, this wicked wicked sin that's going to destroy my family. We need to get back to God's view of sins and get back to God's punishment for sins. These people obviously, I mean, there, was, there seemed to be no lack of people that could bring false accusations against Paul because it wasn't being enforced that anything would even happen to them for, for bringing up a false accusation. It didn't matter. Nobody cared. And that's, that's the way it is today. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 8 of Acts 25. It says, 
while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar have I offended anything at all. He's saying, look, I haven't done anything against the Jews. I haven't done anything against their temple. And I definitely haven't done anything against Caesar. So why am I here? You know, why am I being judged? You know I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't done anything wrong by anybody. I've been living with a good conscience with God and man um, as, it's, you know, as with Jesus Christ. And see, this is important, again, for us. As I mentioned briefly earlier about how we ought to um, be able to live with a, with a pure conscience, right? So that those that falsely accuse us will be ashamed. Well, we see in Luke 2.52, you have to turn there. You can turn to Romans 12 if you like real quick. Keep your finger at Acts 25 and turn to Romans 12. But it says in, in Luke 2.52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So Jesus Christ, you know, this is something that, that we need to keep in mind. You know, you want to keep favor with God first, obviously. You want to be in good standing with God, with a good conscience toward God. But he's saying, you know, Jesus Christ, when he was growing up, he was in good favor with God and with man. He was keeping, you know, himself. He wasn't bringing a bad name upon himself. That he was known among the people and 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 bring and was in good favor and good standing with with men, with other people. And that's the way that we ought to be living our lives. I mean, you don't want to constantly have have people bringing false accusations against you, and you should be living a life above reproach. You should be ministering and serving people and helping people out and be able to have a good name and you're not out to just cause trouble with people in general. That's not our job. Now, if trouble happens as a result of following God and obeying His will and doing what we're supposed to do that He commanded us to do, so be it. Okay? But the Bible says if you're in Romans 12, look at verse 17. It says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. He's saying, look, you need to be honest. Don't be shady. Don't be, don't be one of these guys that, 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 is, that is tricky or does, does these deals that are questionable or, or, you know, that uses guile. You need to be honest in the sight of all men. Verse 18 says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. This is what we're called to do. Look. We're not to go out and just start fights with people and to start strife and, or to be dishonest and to live a life where people will look at you and say that you're kind of a sketchy person. You're, you know, I don't know about that guy. You should be someone who is honest, who is dependable, who is a man of your word, who is someone who people can look at and basically you're in good favor with, with God first and foremost, but then also with men. I mean, at the job, your boss should be able to look at you and, and you should be in good standing among your co-workers and with your boss, with other people in the neighborhood, with other people, you know, you should be the type of person that people can look at and be like, whether or not they agree with what you believe, you can say, you know what, that's still a good person, you know, he's in good standing, you know, he takes care of his family, he does what he's supposed to do, or she does what he's supposed to do, she's a good mother, you know, whatever it may be. We ought to live peaceably with all men. We're not, we're not out to just cause fights and cause friction. Now, God's Word will cause enough of that on its own. And that's why we need to make sure we're in favor with God first and make sure that that doesn't get sacrificed or compromised in any way. But when we know that we're walking right with God, then, hey, walk right with man too. And um, again, that way, it's, gonna just, it's only going to work against these people that bring up these false accusations. If you got someone bringing up a false accusation, but then everyone else around you can be like, no, he's a good guy, you're lying. You know, that's, that'll just help you out, obviously. But if you're already doing things that are kind of shady or kind of sketchy, then people can look at that and then their mind, even if you're, even if you're innocent, you know, if you've been known to do some other things or, or you're not quite as honest as you ought to be, then people can look at you and, and, and start to question that. Then. And start to question whether or not what this false accuser is saying is even true and it'll work against you but if you can live above reproach and and have a clear conscience then they'll they'll be the ones that are ashamed let's keep reading here in verse uh, verse number nine it says but festus willing to do the jews a pleasure answered paul and said wilt thou go up to jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me so again here we see the um 
the willing to do a Jews, Jews a pleasure, right? By the man in charge, by Festus. The last verse of Acts 24, we read it earlier, we'll read it again. It says, but after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, what? Willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So here we see Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure. Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure. And in Mark 15, 15, we see Pilate do the same exact thing. It says, And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Felix, Festus, Pilate, all corrupt. Every single one of them knew that this, their, the person that they were in charge of, that they were supposed to be judging, was innocent. They knew that they weren't guilty. Pilate says, I washed my hands of this innocent man. He knew Jesus was innocent. But that corrupt man just let him go to die. He sentenced him to death. Why? Because he wanted to content the people. This is what democracy will get you. People say, oh no, we live in a democracy today. Democracy is mob rule. Democracy is a bunch of people voicing out saying, well, we want you. And you know what? It could be representative government just as much. Right? Say, well, we're a republic. We're not a democracy. Yeah, I know. But, so you want to put one person in charge and say, okay, well, 99% of the people are saying, we need to kill Jesus. You're representing us, so you better do it. That's the people's attitude today. They think that's a righteous form of government. Instead of saying, well, no, the judge that's in place ought to be a righteous judge, someone who's not going to just, just bend their morals and, and, and bend what's right and compromise righteousness because of what a bunch of people want, because of someone's wicked heart, whether it's 99%, 51%, I don't care how many percent, a judge is supposed to do that which is right. And they're not supposed to pervert judgment. And that's what every single one of these people did here by not releasing Paul, by not releasing Jesus. They're willing to do the people a pleasure. And this is exactly the type of politicians that we have in charge of our country today. They're willing to do the people a pleasure they're going to they're gonna throw them a bone, and, um, and they, they don't judge righteously. They don't judge honest judgment. But let's keep reading here. We're gonna, probably going to get through the chapter a lot quicker now. Verse 10. Um, it says, Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. He says, you, you know I haven't done any wrong. So he's appealing unto Caesar because he knows, you know, back then in, in the, in the, under the Roman rule and Paul being a Roman citizen, he was able to make that appeal where he's saying, look, don't try to send me to the Jews because they're just going to put me to death. You know they're going to put me to death there. You know I'm not going to get a fair trial and you know I haven't done anything wrong. So now he's going to invoke his right of just saying, well, no, I want to be heard by Caesar. Basically, you can take it to the top. And that, that was their way of like, a little bit different than our system, but like, you kind of bring it before the Supreme Court, right? I mean, I want to be judged by Caesar. They said, that's what I want. So, Because he's already been heard by a few people already anyways. But um, it says, um, verse 11, it says, For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things, whereof they ac these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. He said, look, if I did something I deserve, that's my, I'm not going to fight it, right? I'm willing. I'm right here. You can kill me if I've done something worthy of death, but I haven't. And you know I haven't done anything wrong. He's like, so I appeal unto Caesar. I want Caesar to judge me. Verse 12 says, Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. So Festus said, Okay, we'll send you to Caesar. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. So now we get introduced to King Agrippa. And in verse 26, he's going to be the next person that talks to Paul as he's going through all of these different people. And um, verse 14, it says, And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, um, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix. So now he's explaining the situation to Agrippa. He's saying, look, there's a man here, he's in prison, from Felix, it says, About whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver. He basically runs down what's happening here in the story, right? It says, 
And then he says in verse 17, Therefore, when they were come hither, so when the, the chief priests came, without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth, against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things, I suppose, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go up to go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved under the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to see him. So he's saying, look, these guys accused uh, Paul when I was at Jerusalem. So I told him to come over here. We'll try him. I'll hear your case. And he said, but they didn't say what I thought they were going to say because they wanted to put Paul to death. And he's like, they didn't bring anything against him that, that I thought, you know, that's actually against the law. They started bringing up questions. He said of their own superstition. Now, of course, you know, they called it a superstition, but obviously it was their, their religion. Now, the Jews, um, you know, Paul definitely had the right religion, but um, in any case here, they, he's, he's telling them, you know, well, I don't understand their laws and stuff. He's, so I asked Paul, hey, why don't you just go be judged by them in Jerusalem? And Paul says, no. You know, he appealed him to Caesar. So he's like, I decided, okay, yeah, I'll send him to Caesar. So now we see in verse um, 22, it says, Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him. Now, why wouldn't you say, when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, I decided to release him? Now, wouldn't that have been the just thing to do? To just say, you know what? Why would he even waste the time of, a, of Caesar, right? The emperor, right? The, the guy in charge of everything, who he's going to go now and stand before? You already found him innocent. And everybody else before you did as well. Even, you know, the Lysias who sent him down to Caesarea said that, you know, he's a Roman citizen. He saved him out of there. He didn't know, you know, he didn't understand why they wanted to kill him so bad, but he didn't find anything wrong with him. He kept him safe. He kept him protected. He went in front of Felix. Felix found nothing wrong with him. He went in front of Festus and Festus didn't find anything wrong with him. But now he's saying, but I guess I'm going to send him to Caesar. Instead of saying, well, I found him innocent, so I left him free. Total lack of judgment here. Total lack of anything righteous, of a righteous judgment. So it says in verse 26, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. He's like, I don't even have any reason to tell Caesar why I'm sending this guy. Obviously, if he thinks he's innocent, he didn't do anything wrong. What in the world is he going to say, hey, here's this prisoner that's, that's being tried to be put to death. I don't even know why. It says, Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not with all to signify the crimes against him. Uh, yeah, unreasonable? What's unreasonable is keeping Paul bound for two years. What's unreasonable is, is knowing that he's innocent and not setting him free. That's unreasonable. But they're going to continue their circus, and um, Paul's going to get his chance, but as he... Um, God said earlier, God informed Paul that, that he wanted him to witness, to be witness in Rome. So we saw that in one of the earlier chapters. So we see here God's will is going to be carried out because Paul appealed unto Caesar and they are going to send him. But in, we're going to see next week in chapter 26, Paul's um, great speech and, and, and with King Agrippa. And... Um, that one's a little, a lot more interesting, I think, in my opinion, than chapter 25 was. With um, it's basic chapter 25 is a lot of repeat of this. It's like the same exact story happening. You got two guys' names that start with an F. You got Felix and Festus, and it's like the same exact events happen. And poor Paul is just is just just sitting in prison for years. He just loses years of his life um, because of false accusers and because of of people who are just bringing up railing accusations against him. So. Um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this, for this chapter. Lord, I pray that you would please help us use wisdom um, when we speak about matters or about other people, dear Lord, that we wouldn't be quick to repeat things that we hear, dear Lord, that we wouldn't be slanderers, that we wouldn't be busybodies, that we wouldn't be false accusers and railers, dear Lord, that we wouldn't just bring an evil report upon people just because maybe someone else said something. If we don't know for a fact for ourselves, dear Lord, help us not to be involved in that type of gossip and in that type of accusations, dear Lord. Help us to, um, to do what is right. And when someone comes to us with gossip like that, dear Lord, help us to have a stern face and a stern look to turn away that type of, of, um, of sin and iniquity, dear Lord. Help us to, uh, to, to do that which is right. And help us also, dear Lord, to live above reproach. Help us to live a life where we can be in favor with God and with man, where people can look at us and, and, and know that we're, that we're upright and give, and give being a Christian a good name, dear Lord, that they can look at us and we would be hard workers and we would be above reproach that if anyone were to try to bring a railing accusation or a false witness against us, dear Lord, that they would be ashamed because we have a clear conscience. Dear God, we thank you so much for all these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.